Welcome everyone to the Full Spectrum Series. My name is Nick Valentino. I am an assistant director in the Hagen School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and I'll be your host for the series. This is the third year of the Full Spectrum Series where we invite faculty to discuss and explain their fields in an effort to inform and educate uh, prospective and current students who are interested uh, in engineering and problem solving. Uh, parents and alum, uh, we talk about the problems that engineers and computer scientists are trying to, to solve. Uh, so our, our guest today is Dr. Sarah Smith. Dr. Smith earned her PhD from the great University of Rochester. Uh, she is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering and is here today to tell us all about audio and music en engineering. So Dr. Smith, thank you for being here. Audio music engineering, or AME as we call it, is an exciting and growing field. So we want to see if you can give us an overview of, of audio music engineering and, and let us know what uh, you feel are, are the most important parts. All right, wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen with you um, and a presentation. So welcome. As Nick said, I am Professor Smith or Dr. Smith. I primarily teach in our audio and music engineering program, which is a fairly unique program to the University of Rochester. You won't find as many engineering schools that have audio and music engineering. A lot of them have electrical, a lot of them have mechanical. Um, we also have optics, which is a unique program as well. But I'm here to talk about audio and music engineering. And probably the first question that I get asked most often is what is audio and music engineering? And usually if you poll people or ask people about what is audio and music engineering, they give you an answer or describe something similar to what we see in this picture. Is somebody working at a recording console? Maybe they're working to record a live band, or maybe they're working on editing or mixing or mastering a recording for production and release. And that is a huge part of what is what audio and music engineering is. But here at Rochester, we like to define it a good bit broader and define audio and music engineering as everything else that you see in this picture as well. So it's not just the person recording the album or the band. It's also all of the engineering that went into designing the acoustical panels that are on the wall to get a good sound in that room. It's all of the engineering that went into building this mixing console and designing the hardware associated with the microphones or the loudspeakers that are being used in this process. It's software engineers who came in and wrote software for tools like Ableton or Pro Tools to enable recording engineers to do their jobs. And it's also everything else, even outside of the studio. More and more, we're seeing audio and devices that handle audio as a part of our everyday lives. We want to be able to use something like Siri or Alexa to answer our commands to interact with purchasing things or playing music. And more and more devices now incorporate audio that are not specifically a speaker or a microphone that just records or plays back audio. And training engineers who can go and build and design these projects, products at the highest level is one of our aims in the AME program. And so as a brief overview of what we do, we kind of divide this into five different areas. Um, the first being recording and sound design. So the recording part we've talked about a little bit and I think is the part people are most familiar with. The sound design comes in often later. So for example, in movies, the sound design shows up once the film has been recorded and now we wanna add in all the sound effects, the sounds of people walking across leaves or some music that's added into the background. And all of that is encompassed in sound design. And we offer courses on that. Our students have gone on to do internships and jobs in that field as well. So this slide is just showing some of the things we offer here, particularly our studios. We have two fairly decent sized recording studios on campus that our students are able to use in the course of their coursework. And while they're here, um, the larger one shown on the right is in Gabbett Hall, and we also have a smaller studio in Retner Hall that you see in the top left. Similarly, we have sound design labs that our students use to take those courses and work on those kinds of projects. Um, the next major area really is hardware engineering. So that's everything, just building all the hardware that reproduces audio, listens to audio, 
we have a really exciting research project now that's been going on with a couple professors designing flat panel loudspeakers. So a lot of people want to have maybe a surround sound system in their living room, but they don't want it to be huge and clunky. So they would like to have the pictures that they hang on their walls serve as speakers. And so two of our professors, Professor Baco and Professor Heileman, have been doing a lot of work in figuring out how to make those kinds of things sound good and be usable in a system like that. We've had students do a lot of hardware projects as well. Um, what's shown here in the top two left photos are examples of our senior design projects from last year. In the middle, we had a student group that built their own audio interface. So they did all of the audio electronics in it, all of the knobs and screen programming for that. And that was a really great project. Um, the project on the left was looking at flat panel loudspeakers, particularly as guitar amps. And we've had students go on and take jobs in hardware engineering at a lot of the major audio companies. So places like Bose and companies you may not have heard as much about, but Harman, Amazon Labs is their research division for audio. The other big contrast to hardware engineering is software engineering. And software engineering with an AME encompasses a lot of things. It can encompass writing whole large-scale programs like Pro Tools, Ableton that are used for mixing and mastering, but it can also involve programming for smaller things like little synthesizer plugins that makes an interesting sound for people to add to their recording. And there's a large industry around building these smaller little individual effects that can be added on as plugins into a larger environment. And similarly, we've had lots of projects in this area. Our students do a lot of project-based coursework while they're here in their last two years. And that's why I'm able to feature so many student projects here, which I'm really happy to do. Um, this one group built a plugin called Sketch Cassette, which emulates the sound of a, an old cassette recording and a digital recording. And they actually went and founded a company to sell these. And so you can actually buy their plugins for about $10, $20 a piece, I think they sell for now. Um, and so that's a really great example. We've had students do other plugins. We've had students work in augmented and virtual reality environments, creating audio and immersive audio for that. And again, they've gone on to work at companies that maybe are large and small, large companies like Dolby and smaller companies like Immersive Tech, which is based here in Rochester and does some 3D audio work. And then the next area in acoustic in audio and music, the next area in audio and music engineering is acoustics. Um, this is probably less of an emphasis within our program, although we do a lot of it. Um, and it acoustics deals with the physics of sound, right? So it's anything like building instruments to designing rooms. And when they redid Kodak Hall back a few decades ago, they did a lot of acoustic measurements to figure out what they needed to do to make that hall sound great for an orchestra. And there's also a lot of work in designing these kinds of acoustic paneling that maybe you use in your home if, or in restaurants, you see it a lot where a restaurant is really loud and so they hang these panels on the wall to help deaden the sound. And all of that comes in under acoustics. Again, we've had a lot of student projects. We recently had a student project that built a what's called a gobo, basically one of these sound absorbing panels that's movable around the recording studio so that students working in the studio can adjust the acoustics of that room in order to fit the needs of their specific recording. And we've had a few students go on and work in acoustics at acoustical consulting firms are a big one in this area. Um, and so the final area is signal processing. And this is my personal area. This is my love. And I define signal processing for audio as everything that happens between the microphone and the speaker, right? So usually you're not just recording something and then playing it right back. You're maybe saving it. You're probably potentially compressing it into an MP3 file. And all of that is signal processing. You may be putting some effects on it and designing audio effects is signal processing. Or you may be trying to interpret it. So something like 
an Amazon Echo. We'll be listening to your voice to try and transcribe the words that you're saying. And all of that is under signal processing, dealing with analyzing audio and synthesizing audio and processing audio in various ways. And this is definitely a huge area that's led our students to a lot of jobs. I've included a few companies here in particular, but a lot of the larger companies like Apple has also hired some of our graduates and Facebook and Meta and those companies also hire in this area. Um, but there's some research going on here that's great, um, particularly in Professor Duan's lab has done a lot of things in human robot interactions and how to create programs that will process the sound of a live performer and generate some sort of accompaniment or duet with a live performer and a computer. And that involves a lot of signal processing, also a lot of software engineering and that kind of work. And just to wrap up, I wanna talk a little bit about other AME activities on campus. Obviously we have our major and our minor if you're familiar with the Rochester curriculum, we also have a cluster, but there's a lot of ways to get involved with AME and audio at Rochester that are not a full major. So we offer an audio engineering society club. We offer something called open sessions where you can come and watch a recording session live in one of our studios. And there's also a student radio station, which many students choose to get involved in who are interested in AME. And so just to wrap up quickly, I want to list and provide resources where you can connect with us. We're fairly active on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. Things are cross-posted there when we have events or and sometimes virtual events, but definitely in-person events. You can also, of course, find us on our website and more information specifically about the open sessions. I believe they have the recordings of all the past sessions up for the public to listen to, as well as our AES student section. If you're interested in finding more, you can al always email us as well, and we're happy to answer questions. So thank you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. This is, this is great. Um, I, I think the sketch cassette people have been reading my diary. Uh, <laughs> there's such a, a nostalgia for that time I was telling um, my children about how like you would stick a pencil in to rewind a tape that uh, had, <laughs> the tape had come out and, and it's really great to, to see that these things are possible because it's uh, also quality of life right it's the idea that you're you're lending um, uh, your expertise to, to to making people be able to remember parts of their past that they loved um, many of our, our full spectrum viewers are prospective students in in perspective appearance of prospective students so we want to, to uh, know a little bit more about how you got here uh, and to learn more about your outlook on, on audio music engineering. So if we could start at, at senior year in high school, you know, did you see yourself uh, going into audio music engineering? Did you see yourself becoming a professor? Like what would surprise 18 year old you the most? That's a really interesting question. I definitely don't think I foresaw this career. I think this field has evolved and emerged as a much bigger field since I was in high school even. Um, so I went into college, I went, came out of high school interested in physics and engineering, but I exited high school as a physics major and continued with that. But I was always interested in music. And I think I envisioned myself continuing in physics. I knew that I liked to teach. I thought maybe I would become a high school physics teacher. And then as I got more and more into college and then even graduate school before I sort of realized that a good path for me would be to continue with research and continue with teaching and combine my interests in music and engineering into academia and becoming a professor. A, a lot of students um, are, are reluctant because right? we were presented with professions in high school, right? You know, teacher, doctor, lawyer. Um, in this situation where you were able to continue your education in both music and uh, physics, um, it, were you, when did you get to the point, do you really think where you're, you were saying, okay, this is a reality for something that I can really merge into like a job? Did you feel um, this during, is an undergrad or is it in your master's program? Because I see you did physics and music both as an undergrad and then as a master's program before. Yes. Um, yeah, I did. So 
I think it really didn't come until graduate school for me. I think even in undergrad, I was thinking, well, I like the audio stuff or I like the music stuff, but I was thinking, well, I'll probably go work in it at a tech or engineering job. And if that company was an audio company, great. But I wasn't thinking specifically that I would combine them until much later and even in my doctoral work. Yeah, I, and this is really great because we do encourage students to, you know, take courses for which you're interested. You will have major related courses, but, you know, yeah. as long as you keep following what your interests will, there'll be opportunity at the end. So I really appreciate that answer. Um, I want to ask you a question about sort of old uh, technology or, or, you know, historic hardware or whatever. Can you describe what it's like to, I imagine you've examined like older speakers or microphones or things like that. What is your feeling when you do uh, stuff like that? Well, I think it's interesting. It's a really interesting question. I think there's sort of two sides of it because the basics of a loudspeaker really haven't changed since the initial patent in the 1920s or 30s. Um, the fundamental how we generate sound with a magnetic foil to drive a loudspeaker has really changed a lot less than many of our other technologies have. Um, so you can look at a speaker from even the 30s or 40s, and it's not that different on the inside than a speaker that somewhere like Bose is making today. There have been refinements in materials, refinements in design and optimization of things, but the fundamental mechanism is largely unchanged. Uh, I mean, you, you talked uh, in the beginning about how you know we, we recognize like recording as being uh, audio music engineer, or that's like at least people's exposure to it first, or at least their perceived exposure. Yeah. So uh, with that being a misconception about audio music engineer, how, how do we counter that? How do we, in, how are we best inform people of this as an opportunity to incorporate some of the other uh, areas that you talked about? Well, I think it, for me at least, it relates to how we interact and use sound in our environment. I think a lot of what we think about in terms of audio engineering relates to this idea that audio is something that we consume. We listen to music, right? And so there's somebody who made that music that we listen to, um, or we're performers perhaps, and we wanna record our music. So there's someone who needs to record that music. And I think a big thing is realizing how we interact with audio is so much broader now because we have devices that are using voice commands to trigger them. We have hearing aids have evolved exponentially in the last 10 or 20 years. I was saying how a speaker, a loudspeaker hasn't changed very much, but a hearing aid from 20 years ago is vastly different than a hearing aid now. And so we're using audio in a broader way in our interactions with technology now. And the field has expanded in recognition of that. So uh, do you think that, I don't know, this is in terms of just because of um, the, 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 the profit that it can generate. Are the assistants, are the Alexis and series the next big wave or thing in your field or do you think it, it, it's elsewhere? I think they're certainly here to stay, right? Mm -hmm. I think they're becoming an ingrained part almost to the point where they're no longer a fad or a trend. They're just a fundamental part of the field. I think the next big trend that we will likely see has a lot to do with incorporating artificial intelligence, incorporating machine learning into a lot of our audio products. And a lot of that comes in enabling customizations. We're starting to see speaker systems where you can buy a set of speakers for your home and it comes with an app where you walk around your room and it will adjust your speakers to compensate for the resonances of your room. Or being able to have headphones that can maybe compensate for some hearing loss that you have and you can and notice and adjust to that automatically, I think will be a huge trend going forward because that technology is just becoming available and available at a price point that's more accessible. It, 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 we take for granted sound, I think, to some extent, right? Because it's it's uh, all around us. Uh, but, but thank you for for clarifying, especially the, the 
the, the many applications that we have. Um, I, I will always feel like I'm an advisor at heart. So I, I like hearing other people's advice. Uh, what type of advice would you give this, you know, people, students, especially uh, prospective students who are interested in pursuing audio and music engineering? Well, I'd encourage them certainly to do so. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of resources to look into and starting to just look at what these companies are doing, you know, even just going to the website of Apple or looking at Apple's iPhone website or some speaker maybe that you have around your house and sort of poking around and seeing, well, what else does this company do? And is this something I'm interested in? Because you may find that they do a lot more than you think they do. Um, so that's a great way to sort of get a broader sense of the field, um, starting from something you already know. Well, Professor uh, Smith, thank you so much for your, your insight and, and spending this time with us. Well, thank you for having me. The full spectrum series will return uh, with other areas such as biomedical, chemical, optical engineering, and, and much more. So please feel free to share this video. Uh, on behalf of the Hagen School and the University of Rochester, we'd like to thank you for watching and we hope to see you soon.